My name is Carmen Lee Franklin. I'm an environmental historian from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, I work there with the Center of the American West, and our motto is turning hindsight into foresight. So our whole goal is to look at history and how we develop things and, and how that can inform us on how we develop the future. So um, I, I pretty much focus on like the water use in the Southwest, but I've since discovered that the story goes far, far beyond the Southwest and pretty much every part of the world. And that's kind of what I'm, I'm here to talk about today. So, oh, thank you. Let's start this All right. So this thing, this is a ditch runs through it and all about hydromimicry and the development of dynamic hydraulic societies. Um, uh, traditionally, uh, environmental historians have looked at our waterworks as a very linear progression of history, just kind of like they have with all of history, going from the, the humble hunter-gatherer up to the advanced capitalist state. So, you look wrong direction. So we go from the subsistence mode to the Jeffersonian ideal into the sort of capitalist large constructions that we see today. And, I kind of see this as the, the old view, and I, I wonder if this model still really works for, for what we have today. But I'll, I'll go through the steps a little. Um, we start with the subsistence mode, which consists of societies that pretty much live, need to live near the source of water, uh, carry the water from the water, from the river right to the house, and if there's no plumbing, there's no way to irrigate or anything. So these people are often on the move and trying to go where the best resources are available. As villages and societies get larger and they are sharing the, the, the division of water, the water is being moved away from the source, then they need to have some sort of rules to, to manage the water. And that's where we need to have water rights, for instance, which is what you see here. This is a, a postcard confirming a water right that somebody obtained in the 1800s in Colorado, um, which is to see the priority is very important in Colorado. Um, I, this, this sort of division of water and, and using technology developments to, to stretch the water supply started long before the Europeans came. So we have the traditional Zunai waffle gardens shown here where they grew the three sisters crops. This would be like corn, squash, and beans. And growing inside these little cubes, they were able to stretch a very small amount of water and grow a lot of food from a little space. And then over here we have um, a place from Mesa Verde, where we were just talking about earlier. Uh, here at Mug House, where there's, there's a cliff house built into the cliff, they realized that the water would pile up on the, on the Mesa top above, but not where you could use it down in the cliff house. So they dug a notch through the edge of the cliff so the water would work down into this notch and then drop into a cistern below and they built a brick wall to, to store the water in the cistern so they could pretty much just walk right out of their house and scoop a, a cup right into the cistern and have fresh drinking water. And that, they actually found hanging bugs in, in this ruin. That's why they needed to get mug house. So the, the idea of water is very much alive there still. Um, when the Spanish came to the West, they brought their own sort of water use ideas, and they developed what are known as the acequias, which is a system of ditches owned by a group of shareholders. And the shareholders are known as parciantes, which means share, essentially. So, and as part of their share, they are obligated to take part in the community and help maintain the ditch. So, for instance, they have the piazza where everybody gets together and works to clean out the ditch in the spring to make sure that the, it's ready to, to turn on and have a good flow. And this creates a real strong community connection. So, you know, if somebody's down at the end of the ditch and they're not getting water, they, they can go up to their neighbors upstream and they've been working side by side. And so they have that connection and say, hey, I need some water. Can you help me out? And somebody will lay off on their irrigation so the person downstream can have a little more. Uh, this is very different from what happened when the, the when we had the gold rush happened. Um, started in California and was repeated again in Colorado. The miners came out and in order to 
sluice the gold out of the hillside, they would essentially take a big giant hose and spray down mountain and then flash it into boxes and sort the minerals out and see what they could get. And this used a lot of water and they pretty much needed to take the entire stream. So these miners would work out a system of who got the water first. Pretty much that was the basis of it, first come, first serve. This developed into the water law that we have today in the American West, which is known as prior appropriation. And it's a priority system where you you claim the water that you're using, and as long as nobody else has claimed it yet, then you will get to use that amount of water. So when the drought comes, if you're at the bottom of the list, you pretty much just don't get any water. Can we go on to a bit more a, a kind of conglomeration of the, the different types of ethics where we have uh, it, it was we see both in the Mormon communities in Utah and some colonies in Colorado and other parts of the West where we had kind of a religious ethic where the entire community is supposed to work hard together and cooperate in order to, to bring water. In, in Greeley, they built a system of gigantic ditches, like four big ditches that came to the city and they were only able to make a large waterworks happen by having this community cooperation. And it's, it was pretty successful, and actually the colony community persisted for a very long time. Um, Greeley was actually a dry county, but by with or anywhere in the city or nearby for till the 1970s. And so as people were able to build larger and larger, and there was a need for larger and larger projects as the cities grew. But the problem was is individual farmers and, and individual water users don't really have the funds to go and create giant waterworks. So we start looking at foreign investments where, um, for instance, we had a lake in Colorado where they didn't have enough money to expand the, the dam and make it big enough to support the community. So they actually turned to a French bank to and they got a big loan and finished the dam. And then also we have large federal projects like the Hoover Dam, which is shown here, where basically in order to make a giant water system that can support a large city, you, you have to come in and have federal management of that. And I, I think that's kind of where Donald Morsberg was going with his linear progression that we grew into these larger developments that needed larger funding. And uh, but I, I see it as sort of a strange little feedback system where whereas the more you grow water work, you know, the more you grow your water, the more you're growing your population. So if you bring more water, you're going to produce more food, more people are going to say, hey, look, there's food and water over there, I'm going to move there. And they move, and then you end up having more demand for water instead. And as technologies develop, they too take new demands on water. So we go from being this simple society to just trying to basically use water for one use to many, many uses all together. And this gets this pretty crazy. So we use water in many ways. We use it to grow our grains, our fruits, our vegetables, uh, meats, and we do this salt and seasoning. We bottle up our water and ship it around the world, we drink it, brush our feet with it, wash our hands, wash our clothes. Uh, I'm going to uh, it, let's see, we dispose of our waste with it. Um, in our homes and in our factories, we make concrete, harvest lumber, uh, mine coal, we build stuff, you know, we use it to make power so we can make more stuff, we make snow with it, we use it for amusement and recreation, uh, for children to play with in the parks and as we walk our dogs and swimming and tubing and all of those wonderful things. Um, all around us, water supports life, and it's going to continue to support life even long after we're, we're gone. So. Um, we have all these different uses of water. Uh, I wonder, is, is the little guy still out there? Uh, we, we find that, that the acequias and the small ditch companies have been forced to compete with the corporations and municipalities for water, but they're still out there and they're still surviving. Um, on the other hand, we don't have these individual disparate communities anymore. We have this water system where water is shipped overseas. I, I use Fiji here as kind of an exotic example of water that's, that you know, you could get out of your tap, but here it comes 
shipped overseas at great expense and, and people like that. So <laughs> it is a, a global resource that we're sharing. And this creates, rather than a bunch of individual communities, we have one large dynamic hydraulic society. Uh, and now, if you have a, a large society uh, all sharing water, then that seems to lead to the problem. You know, will, will that lead to a global sort of crisis? And with climate change and everything, this, this seems to be a question that people ask a lot. So, uh, I like the, the size of our waterworks and the size of the things that we make seem to make bigger problems. For example, if you build a really large dam, that's going to create sedimentation problems in, in the dam itself. It will also change the flow of the river downstream and upstream. It, it can take a previously cold, fast-running stream and turn it into a slow, warm body of water that's going to support a completely different habitat than what you had before. So we find lots of changes leading to different solutions, and sometimes the solutions create their own problems. Uh, and that, that sort of relates to climate change, which I'm not going to get into too much. It's a big one. But uh, the idea of warming in, in, a, in an area can create the, a change in the timing of, of the flows. So if you have warmer temperatures, your snow will likely melt earlier in the season, and so you'll have a lot of water coming sooner in the season rather than later. This could be really important for, for people who produce the typical cash crops like corn and tomatoes because those use water late in the season. And if the water is coming earlier in the season, um, they can be pretty easy to have to store it or find something else to grow. Um, at the same time, climate change may affect the severity of our droughts and floods and could make the, problems, the sort of problems that we see now even worse. So, and does this suggest that, that we are, are heading into a crisis state? Um, I, I'm not sure that they do, because at the same time, we see our ecosystems adapting all around us. For example, this is the Ute Lady's Dress, which is an endangered orchid that only grows in specific riparian habitats. And it actually now thrives in, in Boulder because of the irrigated fields. So the, seep, the water seeps out of the ditch and into the fields and supports these rare endangered orchids that wouldn't be able to live there otherwise. And they in turn support other things like the butterflies. And as we face problems and we discover new problems, we, we discover new solutions. Um, for instance, on South Boulder Creek, we had a weir that was walking fish from swimming up, upstream to spawn. So they tore out the weir and put in a fish ladder instead. And now the fish can jump on up and, and get upstream. And, and we've learned over time to how to take care of our water systems. And that's, I, I believe that, that our modern society really does resemble in a lot of ways a natural water system in the ways that it adapts and is in form and complexity. Yeah. So I, I kind of came up with the word hydromimicry to talk about this, this resemblance to the constructed waterworks, to the natural waterworks. And, but that also can refer to what we can do with our waterworks to adapt them, to make them more sustainable and extend the, uh, just to create a conversation and get more people involved with the water and to help solve these problems that arise. Uh, when, I, when I talk about how our, our society resembles the, the flow of a, a system, um, I look at the shape of a waterfall. And, and I think most people will agree that the waterfall is one of the most beautiful forms on our, on our planet. And uh, part, part, part of this is the way it flows. And at the top, it has a laminar flow, which is flat and slow. And at the bottom, it erupts into chaos and turbulence. And in between, which is the part of the waterfall that you admire, is this harmonic, rhythmic flow. I think this is kind of how our society goes with water problems, too. We go through times where there's plenty of water to go around, and, and there's no real issues, and everybody's happy. And then we hit a huge drought, and all of a sudden there's water wars and battles, and people are fighting in court over water threatening war, or various things. But somewhere in between, we have this give and take becoming this harmonic use for 
we basically learn to adapt. Yeah. I, I put in the pre-Socratic pre philosopher Heraclitus said that upon those who step into the same river, different and again, waters flow. And we're always in the same water crisis. We're always in the same water system. It's the same water that we've been using for, for centuries is being reused again today. And so too, our water issues flow. And I also think they, they branch in and out. We, we share water in many dynamic ways, and it it scatters and it comes together. And it approaches and recedes, as, as Heraclitus said. And so we have these very complex branching systems where water is distributed and shared. And this is an actual straight line diagram of a boulder and shows how water comes in. The, the big straight line through the middle is Boulder Creek and South Boulder Creek coming in through the bottom. All the little thin lines are the ditches being led away from the, the creeks and then the circles indicate reservoirs and storage bases. So uh, you can see there's a very, very complex distribution system going on here that, that collects and distributes and then recollects and then it moves on to the next city. It does the same thing. So, so I, I think these dynamic aspects are the key to sustaining our hydraulic systems. Um, rather than just making giant, big damaging projects, we can look at the way all of these small cooperative changes can work together and benefit the whole. Um, so even when we're competing for water, we're, we're actually working towards sharing a common resource. We, we are water, our food is water, we can't live without it. But, but on, the other, on the other hand, it's reusable. It's always been here, it's always gonna be here. As long as we can take care of it and keep it clean, it's gonna be there for us. So using hydromimicry, we can avoid a catastrophic water crisis. Um, I, I look at this being an interdisciplinary approach that combines technology, policy, and ethics, and brings together different members of the community to work together to come up with new solutions for water management. Um, for instance, these can combine to create recycling programs or restoration programs, or, or even um, art exhibits and, and educational conferences and things to, to get people excited about something they use every day, you know, thinking about it. And I, I could probably sit here all day and tell you about all the great things that we can do with our water, but I'm just going to list a few here that, that I think are kind of fun and maybe kind of important. Like reusing water, most importantly, we, we do and we, we always will. You can do it in your own home. This is a system that takes your tap water from the sink and puts it in your toilet so that same water gets used again. Same thing happens on municipal scales where you have an entire city that's taking their wastewater and pumping it into a recycling plant and then using that same water to irrigate the parks and stadiums and other needs for water that, that don't have to be as palatable, let's say. Uh, Scale is a big thing. We can look at using, instead of using big giant technology, we can often use little technologies. Uh, imagine a bunch of little micro turbines in a stream rather than one big giant power generating dam. You know, overall, in the end, you might be able to generate the same amount of power without having this big wall that, that really disrupts the environment. Another thing is collecting the rain where it is. Uh, here, this, this roof in South Africa collects water in the middle of the desert, which provides extra water for the people there. But it also cools down the building and provides some free air conditioning. That's a bonus. Let's see. Uh, imitating Mother Nature is always a, a good thing to do. This is an artificial island floating in, in Minnesota Spring Lake that, it, as it floats, it cleans the water, helps like reduce the, the heavy minerals and the various pollutions that have built up there over time. And it also provides habitat for the wildlife and the or the lake. These are flow forms, which uh, are designed to replicate the natural flow of water rather than just having one straight chute to deliver water from one spot to another by 
having it mimic the natural flow it can bring more life to the water. For instance, this this flow form indicates the pulse of a heartbeat and pulses the water as it goes down. And, and I, I didn't pull up a video of this, but if you get a chance, just YouTube up flow form because it's a very fascinating way. So it's a, a sort of flow you don't normally see in the creek, but it is still very natural. Um, here it provides irrigation for sewage treatment plant. And sewage treatment is, is something that we tend to put it off on the edge of the city. We, we don't want to think about it. You know. But perhaps we need to rethink that and think about bringing it into our community and making it a part. Uh, for instance, this is a plan for San Francisco's new public utilities building. And they want to put the wastewater treatment for the building right in the middle of the lobby. And so these plants and planters you see are actually filtering out the water that's been used in the building. Okay. Um, using ecosystem services is incredibly important. Um, we have beavers, um, there's, there's microorganisms in the water that can indicate water quality for you so you don't have to go out and do these chemical tests necessarily. You can monitor these microorganisms and they'll tell you how clean the water is. The beavers can provide flood control and help clean the water quality or help maintain water quality better. Um, there's always a huge connection between water use and the landscape around it and the people who, who live around. Um, I, I refer to Wayne Garden's eyes, Green Belt Movement. Uh, of course, she passed away this last year, but she won a Nobel Prize for pointing out the connections between the, the women in her community and how they didn't have jobs and they, they were just sitting at home and, and living in, in poverty with dirty water and dirty houses. And, then they went out and got jobs by planting the forests and restoring the local community. And that helped prevent erosion, which improved the water quality and created a, a better quality of life for, for everybody. So that, that's an important connection. Um, and, and in a little more modern sense, in a way, we, we have all this, we have the internet at our fingertips and all kinds of great digital technology coming out. And we can use this to, to watch our, where our water goes and how it's used. And, and I think that this, this can bring the conversation out of the community. Like, for instance, digital head, head gates can be controlled remotely. That flow stations can be monitored so that anybody can go on the internet and see how much water is flowing through the tree and how much is available, how much the ditches are taking out, and see where it's going, make that accessible. And that brings me to the biggest thing is that, that we need to make sure that we're sharing water with everybody in the community. And we need to, we need to celebrate it as this beautiful thing and this beautiful resource that, that belongs to all of us. And, oh, so, um, this, is, this is a special water fountain designed by an artist um, at the, the Poliatic Studio. And uh, it tilts down and will pour water as you approach. Uh, I think this is just. One of, one of many, many wonderful creative ideas to make people see the water and think about it, and rather than just you know going and grabbing the bottle of water at a convenience store. Uh, also, museum exhibits. Um, in Boulder, we did a, a something called the Ditch Project in 2009, where we celebrated 150 years of ditch construction. And we had about 40 different artists come together, and we had scientists, engineers, we had a symposium with lots of speeches, and basically we just invited the community to come in and, and check out the water. And this led to this wonderful response. We heard from all these people who were like, wow, I always wanted to know what happened with the water, but I didn't know where to go. So I, we were, they were, our community was extremely grateful to have that, that celebration to go to. And also next year we'll be doing Colorado Water 2012, which will be another big celebration of water. So, uh, and that kind of brings me to the end of it. I, I really think these hydromimicry ideas can offer an approach to the sustainability of our complex waterworks. The efficiency that they can offer can save money, create jobs, beautify our landscape, and give us all clean, tasty water. There's, there's nothing better. The, the biggest part of this, though, is that we have to involve everybody. This is scientists, engineers, farmers, ranchers, children, Everything. We're all involved, so the, the entire community should be involved in these conversations. So, 
and that's it. Colorado. Um, here is my book, Digging the Old West, How Dams and Ditches Sculpted in America. Okay, we have about five minutes, so I'll open for questions. Yeah. And probably in the meantime, if the next presenter could set up the... I have, I have one question. Yeah. Um, my, my, my interest is in architectural and science policy and so on. And you mentioned there about the buildings making use of water and so on. Um, yeah. It's kind of a two-part question. Is uh, is there much policy regarding that? The kind of legislation, I and mean, even the other topics you talked about, and the issues that you want to see happen, mm -hmm. even I, where you are, is there much legislation, or, or is there right, much policy making? Right that? now, our legislation pretty much consists of the rules for distribution of water. Right. There isn't, and we, we do have the Clean Water Act, which has completely changed the, the face. It used to be the waters run through our town where it's just being imported and, and mm. nobody would even think about dipping a toe in them. Now we have like these parks here and, and people go and you can inner tube down the, the river where where it used to be oily and gritty. So I, I I do see a lot of legislation happening that, that is improving that, but I still think we have a long way to go too. That's and kind I of your end goal if you like to get to that kind of more I, I think policy not, based if if we can't encourage it. Yeah. Just, just by saying, hey, this is this is the efficient way to go. You can save money and attract more customers by doing it this way. Then, then maybe we do need to look at the policy then. And that's why I think it's kind of an intersection of different disciplines. Now that you have your book, are you, are you? I mean, do you feel like that's done at the moment? Are you no. promoting the book? Like, I, what is, what's next? Well, I will be promoting the book some, but I, this, to me, is just the beginning. I, I think I, I've discovered that there is a real interest and need out there for the public to learn about the resource use and, and to remove that separation between, like, like essentially, like what comes out of the foster thing. And so I definitely will be looking at new projects. I, I did this book at the request of the Colorado Department of Transportation, and they actually did this as an environmental mitigation project. Which, so they are expanding a freeway, and in expanding that freeway, they are going to mess up some various historical structures, including some ditches. And they just recently started to look at ditches as historical constructs. And this is something that she was talking about in her talk that, that the mill pond is not considered a historic structure when, by all means, it should be. Mm -hmm. It predates the other structures. So. so we are just starting to look at these as as being historical structures and how we do need to take this conversation out into the public. And I think these public agencies are starting to see the need for that level of communication and creativity to be involved in it. So I, I'll be doing a lot more of that. Um, I was wondering if you've um, done any looking into how hydromimicry can be used in um, freshwater deltas, um, just because um, research that um, you and my colleague are doing with on agricultural uses and uh, agricultural diversification in deltas um, to be more you know sustainable. But I was wondering if you've done that. Look at. Um, I look a little bit at, at delta, and there's certainly these, I, like the Mississippi River Delta where they adjusted the flow away and, and completely changed the natural scheme of things. I, 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 think that possibly we could find a, a better way to do that that isn't so threatening to jump back to its native state so quickly. Uh, so I, I, I think I've just started kind of looking over that. And that, that is I, I, one of the many branches I would like to look into is for where these ideas can go. How the uh, regeneration of aquatic life, natural regeneration of aquatic right. well, life, I, I see, well, there's the aquatic life, and, and, and we're all aquatic life in a way. It's, it's, it's tied intimately together. Did I understand your question right? Okay. Um, I don't understand the word um, hydrogenically. I knew it. This is, this is the first time it's gotten out there at all, so <laughs> and nobody steal it, all right? <laughs> So maybe it'll catch on and 
Um, you talked about like the 10 points and then one thing was like small steps and I, I think that's a really good point because uh, I come from Nepal and it's a mountainous country, a small country, developing country. And what we have realized is like there are a lot of big rivers and they have tried to have like the big dams to create hydroelectric and all that. But the biggest problem is that is, you know, you can produce but you know, it doesn't get uh, to reach everywhere. And so lately there is a recognition that, you know, micro hydros are the most effective ones. You know, you have small creeks everywhere or the smallest streams, and that's the most effective way to you know, have electricity to all the rural areas everywhere. Yeah. Um, so that's really a good point. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other question I had was, um, it's, it's about policy, the building bylaws that we have here. And I, I don't know if that would relate to your work, but um, I was wondering uh, what would be your thoughts about, uh, you know, many of the cities, bylaws of the courts that require that, you know, the, the quality of water entering a house or a building has to be same in the kitchen, in the bathroom where you're flushing your private. Yeah, that's true. Well, Would that's, that be? I don't know, if, like like here we don't have a policy that requires that. Mm -hmm. That's just how it works. Uh, they they have one pipe going to your house, and that's, that's the filtered clean water that's good enough to drink. Uh, if in some cases they are um, using, like they've learned how to use just the ditch water straight out from the ditch mm -hmm. for irrigation, in like municipal uses or, or say like like a school might might use um, separate pipes for, for irrigation and, and for that. But I think I think that's something that, that we really are gonna have to look at in the future is like, do we really want to be yeah, I think it's clean really chlorinated to water to be watering lawns and right. washing toilets and things like that. So. I just wanted to ask and, and this is not a setup even though it looks like one, but how, what what do you do to to teach people about the concept of scarcity, particularly in wetter climates where they may not have an understanding of water shortages? Well, that that is a tricky one because I think I think that that's an issue that you see. It's not starting, a setup. Just starting to arise now. Um, we're looking like in South Florida, Palm Beach, Florida, ran out of water this yeah. summer, and that this is an area surrounded by water and swamps and the ocean everywhere, but they actually ran out of drinking water because they have too much population and too many people taking the water. So we're, I, I think as our population globally grows and grows, we're going to start to see scarcity happen in regions where we weren't used to it happening. And I think that they can look at these arid regions like the American West and see how we've been dealing with it for the past 200 years. And Get a few clues and, and ideas, and, and we're willing to share. So. You know, I, I think part of the problem is legislation. So there is the issue about legislation. I think that if, where we come from, Ireland, the Emerald Isle, there's plenty of water. In fact, just two two weeks ago, there was severe flooding because of too much water. Okay. The idea of introducing conservation me methods for recycling and reusing water is something that's going to be very difficult to get into society with people from Ireland. Yeah. But yeah. the only way to do it is legislation because we have developers, I'm an architect and I work with developers all the time, and if they can reduce the cost they're building by X pounds, they will go for it. But if they have to comply with the legislation, then they have to put it in regardless. So I think the use of recycling is vital for all of us in this path. I mean, I'm talking about going very similar this year with a group of people to uh, Ethiopia, a town called Hawkinshi. Well, they have no water. Yeah. <laughs> and there are children dying because they can't get clean water. So we can all learn. Uh, but legislation, I think, is the key. And so we need pressure groups to actually encourage uh, the recycling of water. Because it's a vitally important part of all our lives. We're 80 percent water ourselves. So. Well, and that's, again, I think you need to, the whole community yeah. needs to be in those groups. But it won't change until the legislature changes.